Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is very, very interesting and challenging. It's entitled, The Gospel in Galatians. You know that little tiny book there that Paul wrote, letter he wrote to the Galatians? Well, this is the lesson number eight on that tiny little book for August 19 of 2017, entitled, From Slaves to Heirs. Not A-I-R-E-S or E-R-R-O-S, <laughs> E-R-R-O-R-S, but H-E-I-R-S. What does that mean? Well, let's find out. Please join us in a word of prayer as we begin. Our kind and wonderful Father, we recognize your presence with us whenever we open your word and seek to understand it more fully. We ask the guidance of your Holy Spirit in all that we do that we may come to understand more fully your plan of salvation is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in order to really understand this lesson, we need to think about Paul. Where was Paul born? Tars Tarsus. 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 Tarsus was a very famous, very proud Roman city. Now, what do we mean when we say a Roman city in those days? An outpost of the Roman It Empire. was an outpost. Rome had cities scattered here and there around as a sort of protection to, to keep the lid on any kind of rebellions. But these cities would be controlled by a group of Roman soldiers, usually people who had retired from the Roman army if they, after they had served a certain number of years, and they would be put in charge of this city, and then that city would be regarded as a piece of Rome planted over there. So this was a Roman city, and if you were, you were a citizen of that city, you were a Roman citizen, as if you had lived in Rome itself. But Paul was not only a Roman citizen, what else was he? A Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. 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 That's why he was named Saul, the most famous of the Benjamites, uh, named after King Saul. What else was he? Pharisee. Pharisee. A Pharisee. What do we know about the Pharisees? Very strict. Very strict, very, very particular about observing the rules of those multitudes of rules. They had to fast twice a week if you're a Pharisee, etc. Can you name some other Pharisees that you know about? Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee. Simon. Simon, the one who was a leper who Jesus healed, was a Pharisee. Lazarus. Pharisee. Probably Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, who were his nieces and nephew, uh, were Pharisees, probably. So women were allowed to be Pharisees? Well, we don't know that for sure. Probably not, but at least their family was a Pharisaical family. They were never allowed to be more than 6,000 Pharisees at any one time. And the number of Sadducees was, was much smaller than that even. They were just clumped right around Jerusalem because their whole livelihood was based on their relationship to the temple and their control of the, the marketplaces that was going on inside the temple and so forth. So Paul, when he grew up, or Saul when he was younger, no doubt, many times played, prayed the famous Jewish male prayer, Lord, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And unfortunately, they meant it in that order. So Paul changed his attitude a little bit. How do we know that? Look at Galatians 3, verses 28 and 29. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women, you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham. Notice it doesn't say men. You are descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Does that sound like the male Jewish prayer? No. It's just the opposite, isn't it? As opposite as you can be. And this, many, this idea is repeated by Paul in Romans 3.22 and 1 Corinthians 12.13, Colossians 3.11 and Ephesians 2.15. So Paul was, just as he had changed his loyalty from being a persecutor of Christians, a loyal Jew, to being a loyal Christian, 
and in a sense a, a reprover of Jews, uh, he's now reproving the things he used to believe when he was younger. Well, we know that there were not only the Jew, Jewish males that felt this way. Look at this comment about the Greek males. Much of the Greek tradition could be summarized in the thanksgiving variously attributed to Thales, Socrates, and Plato that, quote, I was born a human being and not a beast, next a man and not a woman, thirdly a Greek and not a barbarian. And there's Diogenes Laerta and so forth where it's quoted. But Paul did more than just eliminate former distinctions. He invited every person who was baptized into the body of Christ to become a true heir, one with Christ himself. So we say Christ was, I mean, Paul was trying to do what? Tear down the walls, right? Tear down the walls. Does that remind you of any modern, modern example? What's going on right now here? Okay, well, yeah, but... Uh, uh, about 30 years ago, someone who stood up in Berlin and Reagan. said, Reagan. Ronald Reagan, Reagan said, Gorbachev, tear down this wall, right? And it happened. Phenomenal. We had the privilege of visiting there just a little while before the wall was torn down, and then very shortly after the wall was torn down again. What a difference. Just incredible. Anyway, moving on. The Chinese Christian watchman Ni put it like this when asked about it by a new convert who was discouraged. No matter how much I pray, this is what the discouraged new Christian said, no matter how much I pray, no matter how hard I try, I simply cannot seem to be faithful to my Lord. I think I'm losing my salvation. So Ni responded, do you see this dog here? He is my dog. He is house trained. He never makes a mess. He is obedient. He is a pure delight to me. Out in the kitchen I have a son, a baby son. He makes a mess. He throws his food around. He fouls his clothes. He is a total uh, mess. But who is going to inherit my kingdom? Not my dog. My son is my heir. You are Jesus Christ's heir because it is for you that he died. Quoted in Lou Nichols, Hebrews Patterns for Living, etc and quoted a long time ago in one of our Sabbath school Bible study guides. We may be sinners. We may do all sorts of bad things. But if we claim to be Christians, God is ready to accept us as his children and his heirs. So why don't we all just become Christ's heirs? Is there any reason why we shouldn't? We're invited to be. We're invited to be. Exactly. So where's the problem? With us. us. Our, With us. Our corrupt wills and lusts and such. Okay. Well, interestingly enough, Paul specifically uses the word sons instead of children. Does that leave the ladies out? Well, in the context, of, as you go on to say there, in the context of that day and age, that's what yeah. they would have understood, well, although it does create some other questions. So. Okay, well, in those days, it was assumed that the sons would inherit, the, the eldest son would get a double portion because it was his responsibility to take care of his parents when they got old, but the rest of the sons would divide the inheritance among themselves. It was assumed that the daughters would get married into another family, and they would help to care for or, or be cared for by the inheritance of those sons in that other family. So it's not saying the ladies are left out. It's just assumed that the, the ladies wouldn't be around to inherit a part of, of, the, of the parents' will. That was just, that's the way it was in those days. So we didn't have unmarried women? Well, I, I'm, I'm tempted to, I'll take a moment to say this. I lived for a number of years in Africa, working as a medical doctor to, in the mission there. And in Swahili, one of the main languages they used in East Africa, they have three words for women. You're the, son, you're the daughter of somebody, you're the wife of somebody, and, and you, your, your status grows as you go from daughter. Daughter is about as low as you can get. Then you were wife of somebody, now someone has picked you, you have some status now, and then you are the 
mother of a son, and that's the highest status you can reach as a woman. So my wife, all the years we were out there, she was known as Mama Todd because she had a son, but our son's name was Todd. So that was, that, she was respected because she was called Mama Todd. We had a, a woman, an older woman, not really old, but you know, probably post-menopausal woman, who came out to work at the college there in Tanzania, and she had never been married. And they didn't know what to call her. I mean, they didn't have any word for that. They finally ended up just saying, daughter. They called daughter and then by her first name because there was, there was I mean, and that's the way it was in, in, in Jesus' day. It was that same general idea. Do we so, have examples of uh, women who were baptized? Oh, yes. What about examples of women who offered sacrifices? Well, can you name one? A woman who was baptized and became a very important person. Was well, Lydia baptized? Lydia, exactly. Was she baptized? Do we have a record that she was? Well, it seems so. It, it doesn't say so. It doesn't so. say so specific. <laughs> no. if, you, if you travel to that part of the world, they will show you the spot where she was baptized. Well, yeah, but Whether. it's not even in Scripture. Yeah. Wasn't the Philippian jailer's whole family baptized? Yes, and, and Cornelius' whole family were baptized. So I, I think we have examples of women being baptized. Or some might say, well, that whole family, that, that, that implies it's just the men. Huh? No, it doesn't well, mean that. <laughs> some would say that. <laughs> well, furthermore, the children of Israel came to be known as the sons of God. Right? That was, that was the patriarchal system that they were familiar with. Paul wanted to be clear in stating that Gentile sinners could also be a part of that family, children of Abraham. And we already read the verse. But the physical act of baptism, now Paul talks, Romans 6 and other places, about we join God's family by being baptized, right? But the physical act of baptism does not accomplish such a change. Where does the change happen? In our hearts. It has to happen inside of us, in our hearts, in our thinking, in our, in our, in our loyalties, and so forth. Our this, will. Our will, yeah. This means that Christ becomes the center of our lives. If we're going to receive that amazing inheritance, then Christianity, our new identity, must affect every part of our lives. How does this actually work? Well, there's a passage which we've quoted many times, but it's so appropriate here, I'm going to quote it once more. By beholding, we become changed. How do we become, be, become like Christ? We look to him and try to copy his life. Now, we can't do that on our own. And I quote, this is Great Controversy, page 555. It is a law, both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature, that by beholding, we become changed. What does it mean, beholding? What does that mean? Watching, looking at it. Watching, dwelling looking, on, dwelling on, focusing on. Him ever before us. Yep. But Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood. What he was saying, incorporate everything. That's the way I would look at it, is everything you, you can learn from me, do so. Yeah. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. That's why we encourage all our young people to spend their time playing video games, right? It becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than the st his standard of purity or goodness or truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. What does inevitably mean? For certain. It's certain that... Can't, can't change it. It's going to happen, right? I, I think about all the evidence we have in, our, in, in medical research and so forth about what we should be doing and how we should raise our children. Just this week, our national standards came out no child under the age of one should ever be given a sugary drink. Try to imagine that. 
up to the age of, I mean, I might not have this exactly right, I think it's up to age four, something like that, no more than two ounces max in a day. And then over five, no, was, I think it's up to two, uh, two ounces, and then from two to five they could be allowed four ounces. And I have kids come in all the time, you know, here's mom, big old bottle full of who knows what, even Coca-Cola. You just, anyway, that's a little getting off from our lesson, but. Do our friends and associates at work and even our casual acquaintances recognize Christ in us? Remember that famous verse, Matthew 5, 16? In the same way, your light must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and think, my, isn't that a great person? Now, what are they supposed to say? Praise your Father in heaven. How do we, how do we get people to do that? Well, we don't force them. They have to choose. Mm -hmm. they get to, if they look at uh, Jesus, uh, Steps to Christ 68, it says, In the matchless gift of, God, uh, of his Son, God has encircled the whole world with an atmosphere of grace as real as the air which circulates around the globe. Amen. All who choose to breathe this life-giving atmosphere will live and grow up uh, to the stature of men and women in Christ Jesus. Um, and then it will be said, as it says in Isaiah 60, Arise, shine, for your light has come, mm -hmm. and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Do you know anybody that you work with, or anybody that's known in your place, that people say, that person just makes a difference in their environment and among the people they work with. Well, what's implied by being an heir with Christ? I mean, the whole universe belongs to God. I mean, let's be honest. There's no question about that. Think of the incredible privileges that are included with that designation. Just as Jesus ascended to the Father, we, in association with him, are invited into that intimate relationship. And Jesus said, as I and the Father are one, so I want you to be one with me. I mean, I don't think we, we can even comprehend what that means. We can be as close to Jesus as Jesus is to the Father. Is that really possible? At the third coming, God is going to move his headquarters to our planet. Revelation 21. But there are also huge responsibilities involved. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel lost their special relationship with God because they ignored the responsibilities while claiming all the privileges of that special relationship. Do you think we can make that same mistake? Well, during that last evening that Jesus spent with his disciples on this earth, after washing their dirty feet and seeing Jesus get up and leave, he said to the eleven, I don't want you to be slaves any longer. I want you to be my friends. Okay, so now we have slaves. We have sons and daughters. We have friends. We have heirs. Which of those do you want to be? More than one? Sure. Which is most important, do you think? A friend is probably the one that understands the person, understands God the most. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are heirs that don't even like their parents. We don't want to be like that. Paul went on to say that those who become a part of the body of Christ become so close to him that they refer to him as daddy or papa. Now, the, you know, the word in, in Aramaic or Hebrew was Abba, Abba. 
But that's that's the name for Papa, Daddy. Could we get to that place? Would we dare to address God like that? I remember a time many, many, many years ago when I was in medical school that there was a meeting, an afternoon meeting in the university church. And we had just talked about this in one of our classes. And Uncle Arthur, Graham Maxwell's father, but this is the, the one who wrote all the books, Uncle Arthur's Bedtime Stories, etc., came to give a presentation in that time. And, and Arthur, I mean Graham Maxwell, his son here was head of the department uh, and that, and that really in that here in the, in that t at that time, invited one of our group, our young people who was with us, to come and pray. And we had just talked about this. And uh, he got up and he prayed, Good afternoon, Father. And Graham Maxwell said he was afraid his father was going to die of a stroke right there on the spot. He wasn't used to having. But that's what God asks us to do. Isn't it? Do we have to earn God's love? No. Love is given. Yeah, we have to accept it. Accept it. We've talked about a Pythagoras last week, a guard, a guardian, a guardian, uh, a guide, someone to discipline them and teach them the right way. Well, you asked if we have to earn God's love. Does God have to earn our love? Yes, He does. Unfortunately. It should come naturally, but it doesn't. Or and he, Romans 3, 4, God is the one that's on trial before the mm -hmm. universe. Yeah. And he earned our love by sending Jesus, didn't he? Showing what kind of love. We love him because he first what did what? Loved, loved us. us. And, and he, he loved us. He showed his love for us by... Sending his son, right? Romans 3, 25 and 26, yeah. Jesus' death was to show that God is righteous. God will yeah. always do the right thing. Well, we have some challenging words here in the next few verses. Look at Galatians 4, 1 to 3. But now to continue. The son who will receive his father's property is treated just like a slave while he is young, even though he really owns everything. Think about Watchman Nee's comment. While he is young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until the time set by his father. And what are those people called? Pidagogoi, right? In the same way, we too were slaves of the ruling spirits of the universe before we reached spiritual maturity. What in the world does that mean? The ruling spirits of the universe? Well, you got Ephesians 6.12, and then you got... Uh uh, Psalms 82, all of Psalms 82, uh, th those, God has granted an awful lot of freedom to intelligent creatures, and I'm talking about those that came before the creation of this earth, mm -hmm. the, the, the people on this earth. So there's uh, well, a lot of influence. If you take this, this exact wording in the Greek, it's used in a couple of other places. See what you think it means in this context. Now I'm looking at Colossians 2.15. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. He made, that's the, he made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory procession. That's the same spiritual rulers and authorities, the same expression. What, what, how did Paul, and then Hebrews 5, 12. Though there has been long enough time for you to be teachers, that you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone has to drink milk is still a child, and, and so forth. So, would in that context, in the light of this, Paul is using this expression. It seems likely that he was talking about the, the elementary steps in the Christian life. Free yourself from those beginner steps. Learning, you don't have to keep relearning the alphabet, hopefully, right? Baby Christians may feel like they are bound by rules and laws that did not affect them in the past, but now that they have accepted Christianity, they're working their way through the alphabet of the Christian life. In Colossians 2, 8, he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, mm -hmm. according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. So he's setting those in opposition. So I'm not sure he had 
the law per se in mind, but more the man-made rules and things. Mm -hmm. uh, because he says, why do you, further down, why do you submit yourself to such decrees as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, uh, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of man? So there it appears to be with, uh, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Okay. Hebrews 10 has some interesting things to say. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. So that would suggest that we need to go beyond those beginning le levels, right? Now, a lot of people will remember a verse found in Matthew 18, verse 3, that says, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So in what sense are we supposed to be like children? Teachable. Teachable. Yeah. Okay. We can also believe in things that uh, may, and I think you used the term gullible in there, but... Uh, you know, we, as Christians, we believe that Jesus rode from the dead. Uh, from a, Are we gullible? From a worldly standpoint, that's ridiculous, you know. Science, you know, where's the scientific evidence that mm -hmm. somebody can raise, rise from the dead? So uh, that could be a, a childlike faith, yeah. something that we trust in because we know the, the source of the information. Here's a question I would like to throw you, throw to you out there in the audience to think about as well. If a child fails to grow physically, we become alarmed. If he fails to grow mentally, we are very, very disturbed. I mean, that has to be, attention needs to be directed to that immediately. We've got to solve that problem. But if a child fails to grow spiritually, we, do we say, well, that's wonderful, that's sweet, that's very nice? Isn't that cute? Let's take a video and put it on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a couple of verses that, um, well, let's just look, for example, at the one of the ones we just looked at, Hebrews 5. There's much we have to say about this matter, but it is hard to explain to you. Now, Paul is writing to young pastors who are being trained to be Christian leaders. Because you are so slow to understand, there has been enough time for you to be teachers Yet you still need someone to teach you the first lessons of God's message. Instead of eating solid food, you still have to drink milk. Anyone who has to drink milk is still a child without any experience in the matter of right and wrong. Solid food, on the other hand, is for adults who through practice are able to distinguish between good and evil. Let us go forward then to mature teaching and leave behind us the first lessons of the Christian message. Now, those first lessons are not wrong. They're just there's a lot more to learn. You're, supposed to, you're not supposed to give up on those first lessons. You're supposed to move forward. We should not lay again the foundation of turning away from useless works and believing in God or the teaching about baptisms and the laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. Let us go forward. And this is what we will do if God allows. So there's something beyond just being childlike, right? Children ask a lot of questions. They want to learn. If your picture of God has not grown in the last year, you're worshiping a graven image. Look at Galatians 4, verse 4. That's another one that's raised a lot of questions people thought about. But when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law. The right time. What made the time of Jesus, the right time. Ellen White has a whole chapter on that in Desire of Ages. Okay. Fullness of time. What does it mean? Well, the prophecies, of course, uh, pointed to that time. Exactly. The, as you point out in the lesson there, the Pax Romana it was safer to travel because of the presence of the Roman soldiers and things, not that there weren't bandits out there, but it was, yeah. it was safer in general. Another and thing she points out is the, the scripture had been translated into the language of the people, what we would call the Septuagint, into mm -hmm. Greek. Mm -hmm. And Greek was the was lingua franca. 
of, of those days, wasn't it? So pretty much everybody knew at least some Greek, and they and the Bible writers kept their language pretty simple, and they, so that ordinary people could. And I've had the privilege in some of my travels in Greece and Turkey of actually walking on some of those Pax Romana ro roads. They're you know pretty bumpy and pretty stony now. What's left of them, but they were they made it possible for the Roman army to get to where they needed to go pretty quickly. Um, and there was somewhat of a common culture, not a completely common culture, but somewhat of a common culture, which made it easier to spread the gospel. But there's another reason that we usually don't talk about that I think is important. The sect of the Pharisees had come to dominate the culture in Palestine. They seemed to be the super religious people, but it was those same Pharisees who were most determined to get rid of Jesus Christ. They were people who seemed to dedicate their whole lives to serving God. However, they ended up crucifying the very God they claimed to be serving. The Pharisees were no better than the pagans. This demonstrated that the ditch on each side of the road is just as deep and just as treacherous. Scary thought, huh? Well, what do you think of the Jews of the Old Testament? Do you think they would have killed Jesus? Yes. <laughs> or would they just have ignored him like they did, the, like they ignored most of the prophets? Well, Stephen, Stephen seemed to bring out the fact that, that they killed the prophets and, and now they've killed Jesus as well. Why was it necessary for Jesus to become fully human? Be born from a human mother? Grow up, spend those many years in Nazareth? You think of, I mean, there's well, he couldn't have died the second death without being a human. Okay, that's one very good reason. Any others? He couldn't have died the first death. <laughs> yeah, that's also true. Your plane couldn't have died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. He died to show that Sam. Adam could have done it in the beginning, could have lived a, a, a solid life. A, he didn't have to. It didn't have to follow Adam and Eve. Neither one needed to uh, sin. Well, the question was, why was he f become fully human, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, rather than why he died, because th that that is answer is not. Uh, Romans three twenty five is he and, and twenty six. He died to show that God is righteous. Mm -hmm. and that's about all it says. There's no other place that I've found where it explains the reason why and, the die. efficacy of Jesus' death. Okay. But now, why did he have to become human? Well, like I said before, you, you, <laughs> a humans die. Mm -hmm. No other in, intelligent creatures, including uh, those that lived before, have died. Well, let's, let's think about something. Satan had made some claims. One of his claims is, the first claim was that we would all be better off if we lived under his kingdom. God says, that's just not true. And they demonstrated that in various ways. But then he said, now that we have become sinners here on this earth, no human being can ever live a sinless life. And what did Jesus do? So that it could be done. He lived a sinless life. Yeah. Disproved that claim of Satan, yes. Yeah. And he did it all the way to his death. Yes. In the face of death, he did not give up That's love. Right. And he exactly. Said he lays down his life and t we'll take it up again, and uh, you're not even get, get a chance to kill me. He demonstrated the righteousness of God in a human life. Unbelievable. All the way to the last drop. Yeah, all the way to the last breath. And that process, that death process, was what mm -hmm. saves us, heals us, uh, the way we think about God. I notice that we haven't mentioned the traditional answer, which is, he came, Jesus came to this earth, became a human, so that God would know what humanity goes through. So that is a falsehood. I wonder where that came from. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me think. Uh, the devil? <laughs> well, there's a couple of verses going to be misunderstood to suggest that one in Hebrews 2, near the end of that chapter, and one in Hebrews 4, near the end of that chapter. But those, I said, can be misunderstood to suggest that. But he, he came to demonstrate for us 
what a truly God-like life should be. He came as a teacher yeah. and not as a penalty payer. <laughs> it wasn't so that God could learn something no. that he didn't know. He came so that we could see what God is like. Well, look at Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Well, when the right time finally came, we've already mentioned this briefly, God sent his own son. He came as a son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law to redeem, notice that word, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might become God's sons and daughters. What does it mean to redeem something? Buy it back. To, uh... Okay. Well, this is a neutron in Greek, which really means to make free, to make a slave free. Okay. We are slaves to sin. Mm -hmm. He came to free us from the slavery of sin. Okay, very good. Uh, it's yeah, interesting. Back in the second year, it says, uh, when the time had fully come, that's the RSV, mm -hmm. where you got Colossians 1, 19 and 20, in the fullness of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, it was at the appropriate time. He didn't come before he created this earth, even though there was evil in the universe already. It didn't come at the time of the flood or after the flood. It didn't uh, come... Uh, before s slavery and, and, uh, and of Egypt and so forth, it came at that time when there was a lot of religion, a lot of religious people uh, misrepresenting God. Yeah. yeah, in fact, the only people who had the word of God were the Jews of the time, and there was total confusion among the Jews when he came. Yeah. There were all kinds of sects and all kinds of different views and opposing views. We needed a savior from our own falsehood yeah. and false understanding and knowledge of God. It's interesting that in the first two, three hundred years after Christ died and went back to heaven, there developed a theory about our salvation and why Jesus had to die called the redemption theory. And, or, uh, and it was based on the idea that Children were, were kidnapped from their parents and then someone, a, a, an enemy force would hold them until a great sum of money was paid. And it goes something like this. They believed that when we sinned, we sold ourselves into the hands of Satan. So Satan now controls us because we're sinners. So God comes to Satan and he says, "What? guess what? I will give you Jesus in exchange for all the sinners. And Satan says, oh well, what I always wanted to be to do was to be in the place of Jesus. So, yeah, I'll give you all the sinners and I'll take Jesus. And so he takes Jesus by, of course, Jesus dies and that's why he takes him. He enters the, the kingdom of Satan. But then, lo and behold, Jesus escapes death and goes back to heaven. So God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. How does that sound? That's what Christianity believed the first thousand years. Sounds like a Anselm. <laughs> Sounds like a movie theme. <laughs> well, many of our Christian friends would suggest that it was necessary for Christ to come and live and die in order to be legally qualified to pay the price for sin. You've heard, all heard that expression many times. What does that mean? Does justice require the death of someone to pay for sin? Who is justice? Would that be the Father requires it? Who is, specific, who is it specifically that is requiring that death? Is it the Father? Did Jesus need to do something to assuage or propitiate the Father's wrath against sin? Does that suggest that the Trinity is not always in perfect harmony? I mean, is the Son, now does he have to... I mean, think about what's usually presented by many of our Christian friends. You pray to maybe one of the saints, and that saint speaks to Mary and, and Mary speaks to Jesus and then Jesus speaks to the Father because you wouldn't dare speak to the Father directly, right? And, and by the way, those saints that are, that are nominated by the Catholic Church, what's the purpose of having Catholic saints? They have extra merits that they can parcel out. They have out. extra, they're people who have done more good things than bad things and so there's a balance. So they have some extra good left over. They can share it with you. 
well, does the son need to plead with the father in order for him to forgive us? No. no. That is paganism. That's absolute paganism. The father is forgiveness personified. God so loved yeah. the world that he gave. And that means that Hitler's forgiven, Idi Amin's forgiven, uh, all's forgiven. The problem is not everybody's healed or had ever yeah. Salvation means healing. Yes. So those, those, those people may, are not going to be in heaven probably, in fact almost certainly not going to be in heaven, but doesn't mean they're not forgiven. So what really happens to a person when he's baptized, if he's correctly and baptized the right way? Does the water do something to him? No. So what is it that God's looking for? What's the true baptism? Change of your heart. Yeah. Which is your thinking, right? Your yeah. thinking, yeah. In other words, what becomes the center of your, of your life? That this mind be in you is in mm -hmm. Christ Jesus. When we are buried with Christ, Paul, Paul talks about this, it's like burying the old man of sin, and you rise to a new life, that's the Christian life. If we do that, will God regard us as his heirs? Is it what we do or what we think? If oh, our thoughts are focused on self, yeah, obviously, yeah, it's this what we think. Yeah. Well, we're the heirs because that's what we are. We're mm -hmm. children of God. If we're born again, then we are children of God, and do we and it's heirs? Do we actually become children of God, or have we been always children of God? Always. That's a that's a bad question, isn't it? Yes. We're supposed to be, all of us are supposed to be children of God. Mm -hmm. Some of us recognize that we are children of God, right? Well, some people want to be children of God, which implies that your focus is no longer on self, but on others. But Jesus talked about the Pharisees being uh, children of the devil. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more than just, uh, you know, your physical life. Well, not just the Pharisees. He said that about the Sadducees too. Probably. <laughs> there in, Ro in, in, the in John eight, who didn't he? Yeah. Well, how well did Jesus deal with Satan when he was here on this earth? Well, look, you know the story about the temptations that Jesus went through um, out there in the wilderness after he was baptized. Here's Ellen White's comments. Now, at the end of his life, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power, using force, is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon these principles. I'm sorry. Um, his authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love, and the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral, and the truth and love are to be the prevailing power. Now, when we think about two forces, two armies maybe or so forth, meeting against each other, we, we often think, okay, now which one of them is more powerful, which one, how is the balance of powers and all this kind of stuff. And, but here's two armies, the most important armies in the history of the universe, competing against uh, each other, and Satan is using lying and stealing and selfishness, self-interest, conceit, uh, deceit, I mean, and the list could go on and on. And God uses truth and love. Does that sound like a fair conflict? Evil is more powerful every time, but that doesn't mean evil will eventually win this battle between good and evil. So she goes on to say, it was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security. And in the councils of heaven, it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his system of government. What did we say a little while ago? Jesus came to show God's, that God's way of running things was the only, only right way, right? 
Satan had claimed that these were superior to God's principles. Time was given for the working of Satan's working out of Satan's principles that they might be seen by the heavenly universe. Satan led men into sin, and the plan of redemption was put in operation. For 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and degradation, and the heavenly universe beheld it all. Desire of Ages 559. So who's learning from all of this? 759. I'm sorry, 759. Who's learning from all of this? Everybody. All intelligent Everybody creatures. Everywhere. The heavenly universe she specifically mentions. The whole, this earth is the theater of the universe. Where do we get that idea? 1 Corinthians 4.9. 1 Corinthians 4.9. God tells us that when we are baptized, he adopts us into his family. What does adoption mean to Christians? What did Paul and what does God promise to those who are adopted? Life eternal. Okay. Look at some of these choices. Final victory over the devil and his, te his temptations. Look, look at, here's one of the passages that is misused. Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death and in, his, in this way set free those who are slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. Now, how does fear of death make us slaves? We will do anything to avoid death. People will try to do anything to avoid death. And so, Satan, down to, think of what was going on in the Dark Ages. The church said, if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. And, I mean, people were scared to death. Right? Okay. The God promises his children final freedom from death. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. Where death is your power to hurt? Death gets its power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is the great controversy already won? Yes. Who won it? Jesus. Jesus did. Freedom from sin and all that it implies. Look at Romans 6, 23, 22. But now you have been set free from sin and are the slaves of God. You, your gain is a life fully dedicated to him, and the result is eternal life. And the list goes on. Freedom from the condemnation of the law. Um, I don't know how many of these things I should take time to read. In light of these statements... Have we truly become children of God? Well, even in the Greco-Roman world, there was a well-known legal adoption code. It included the following provisions. Let's, before we go to those real quick, when a child is adopted in our day, what does that imply? Does he have the full rights of a child? Can it be revoked? No? Now, we, there's a lot of talk these days about children who grew up, who were adopted, who, who try to find their, their birth parents. Does that undo their adoption? No. Not at all. Not at all. So even in the Greco-Roman world, there was a well-known legal adoption code. It included the following provisions. The adopted son became the true son of his adopter. The adopter agreed to bring up the child properly and provide the necessities of food and clothing. The adopter could not repudiate his adopted son. The child could not be reduced to slavery. The child's natural parents had no right to reclaim him. The adoption established the right to inherit. And there's the use and abuse of parallels and various, the references are given there. It's very interesting to notice that some of the most famous Caesars were actually adopted. Their, parent, their, their father couldn't have any children. Who knows? You could speculate about why that might be, but um, the fathers didn't have any children, so they adopted. Some, some of the Caesars were adopted by, I mean, they would pick out a promising 
young man that they thought might be a good man said, we're going to adopt you and you're going to be the next Caesar. So did they adopt them as teenagers or as infants? Usually as teenagers. Uh, interestingly enough, our daughter-in-law, her father died when she was less than a year old. Mm -hmm. And her stepfather, for, for all practical purposes, he's been her father yeah. for the whole time, and she's very close to him. And they, her, her, her father legally adopted her a couple years ago mm. you know, because of, you know, some concerns that came up about what might happen to his estate. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they went to the, before a judge and went through all the ceremony with the judge, and then the judge handed over a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he usually gives to adopted kids. Well, <laughs> okay. here's a... <laughs> it's called adult adoptions. Yeah. It's called what? Adult adoptions as opposed to a step yeah, parent yeah. or, or yeah, an yeah. independent uh, exactly. adoption. But it has the same oh, legal yeah. force, doesn't it? Yeah, but from a st legal standpoint, that's correct. I think we have to be careful not to compare our adoption to God with the adoption well, of a child. That's what I want to talk about next. Yeah. How is our adoption by God any different? We have to think like Christ to be adopted, mm -hmm. or at least be willing to think like Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we can, but that we should be driven to think as he does. Well, and so what we're saying really, in the case of Christians, we have to become like our parents, that is, God, Jesus, if you will. I mean, that's the way we become adopted. We don't have a legal paper that says we're adopted. We're adopted by adopting their behavior, their lives, their, their ideas, and so forth. And that leads us back to that verse we talked about earlier, or and a different one or the other, but where the same thing is said, we, we can call God Abba, Father, or what does that mean? It's like Daddy, Papa. Imagine God saying, I'd like you to call me Daddy. So what's the difference between a child and a friend? They can be the same. Hopefully they are the same. Yeah. But friends tend to be, that we usually have more than those, of those than we do have children. Shared experiences, mm -hmm. uh, usually good, well, it can be bad things. You mm -hmm. have friends who relate to the same things that you do because of what you've been through or choose to go through or choose to do together. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, let's go back to Paul now who, who wrote these things. How did, he, how did he do in his association with Gentiles? Was he able to overcome his pharisaical prejudices? Yes. It pretty seems like it from some of the things we've looked at, doesn't it? Look what he comments about 1 Corinthians 9.21. In the same way, when working with Gentiles, I live like a Gentile outside the Jewish law in order to win Gentiles. This, this does not mean that I don't obey God's law. I'm really under Christ's law. Among the weak, I, uh, weak in faith, I become weak like one of them in order to win them. So I become all things to all people that I may save some of them by whatever means are possible. So what do you think it meant among the Gentiles, I live like a Gentile? He didn't he wasn't carousing. He wasn't what? He didn't uh, obey the Jewish rules of yeah. diet and so on. It was blending in, I think, yeah. is the best way to put it. And we ought to blend in. Yeah. We try to stick out in any way like the Pharisees did. Uh, it doesn't win us friends. No. So how can we become more and more like God now? By beholding, we become changed. Jesus had an incredible relationship with his Father even while he was living on this earth as a human being. Did God actually direct his life moment by moment? This is from Ministry of Healing 679, I believe. Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. 
As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. Why do you suppose Jesus spent the entire night in prayer just before he chose his 12 disciples? Luke 6, 12, I think it is. Depended on his father. And he, those, those nights in prayer, he and his father, I'm sure, discussed what's going to happen the next day. It was all, they had it all worked out. Well, what, what role should our devotional life play in our relationship with God? I think I have time to read another couple of verses before we're done. Very early the next morning, long before daylight, Jesus got up and left the house. He went out of the town to a lonely place where he prayed. But Simon and his companions went out searching for him. And when they found him, they said, Everybody's looking for you. But Jesus answered, We must, sorry, we uh, must go on to the other villages around here. I have to preach in them also because that is why I came. So he traveled all over Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. That's quite a combination, preaching in the synagogues and driving out demons. Yeah, but well, there's more than ways than one to drive out demons. Mm -hmm. There are demonic thoughts in all of us, and the truth is the only thing that takes us away from such thinking. In the last few verses in our passage, Galatians 4, 8 to 20, we don't have time to read them right now, but he talks about people paying attention to certain days and months and seasons and years, talking about those old pharisaical ideas that he used to think were so important when he was younger. Do you think he was talking about the Seventh-day Sabbath there? If he meant to include the Seventh-day Sabbath, he could have mentioned it by name, because he does in Colossians 2.16 in a different context. Jesus, I don't think Jesus in the Gospels mentions the Sabbath, as far as... Uh, yeah, he does, by he performing it, miracles on it. I understand, that, but he, he, when he, in Matthew 19, he gives these uh, lo rules and regulations that are part of the Ten Commandments, yeah. but he doesn't quote uh, the Sabbath. Yeah. And yeah. also, when it came time for the festivals, I guess we're out of yeah. time here, so... Yeah, well, basically he said to those Galatians there, do you really want to go back into slavery? Do you really want to go back in slavery? Even in our day, conservative Christians tend to follow a lot of rules. How many rules do we follow today that aren't really biblical, that don't really matter to God? And are we following all the right rules? Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to have you as our example, to show us the way, to make it clear to us exactly what you want out of our lives. May that be our experience and be the experience of everyone listening today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.